By the way, I should mention that um, apologetics can really fire you up um, because, again, it, it just tends to take things that are more abstract, maybe things that don't seem as real, and it brings you back to reality. Um, in, in Sproul's approach, it's going to be a little bit more uh, cerebral, but um, he's really seeking, and this is probably better for the evening, but he, he's really seeking absolute certainty in his apologetic reasoning, in his method, and that's why he uses rational arguments instead of arguments drawn from the things that, that we basically see and the various evidences that we often point to, like we did a couple of years ago. So it does tend to be a bit more cerebral, but once we understand it, I think it's, it's very, very powerful. All right, well, let's get to our text this morning. Because, again, we do see some apologetics here, but the apologetics are, are really provided by the Lord in signs and wonders. It's provided by the love that the early church experiences in their unity. And it's also provided by eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have all these evidences being presented, but we're also going to see that in and of themselves they're not persuasive. The Spirit of God needs to work through these things to bring these leaders to faith. All right, so um, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42, rather than 41. All right. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them, However, the people held them in high esteem, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to such an extent that they, were even that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. But the high priest rose up along with his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported, let's see, and they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely. And the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about, about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Uh, when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross, he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they had heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. 
After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. It's quite an encouraging story. May the Lord bless uh, our understanding as we take a look at the various things we see here. Now, last time, remember, we saw the, the love and the fellowship that the church enjoyed. As the apostles were preaching and the membership was increasing, so was the believer's generosity. You know, those that had property sold it and brought the money to the apostles to distribute to whoever had need. Now, Luke told us that a Levite by the name of Joseph... Um, sold some land, and brought all the proceeds to the apostles. And his example was such an encouragement to the others, not just in the sale of the property, but just in his life in general, that the apostles gave him the name Barnabas. You know, they, they honored him. The name means the son of encouragement. Now, his sacrifice and this honor appears to have inspired a couple of others uh, to do something similar. Ananias and Sapphira, though it seems like they were more after the honor than they were the, the sacrifice. They also sold a piece of property, you'll recall, pledging to give the whole amount to God. But they brought only part of the proceeds. In their attempt to deceive God, to deceive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit struck them dead on the spot. Now, needless to say, this concerned all the believers who uh, began examining their own lives to make sure that they were dealing with their own sins. Now, this is something I, I should mention, can't help but mention, that Jonathan Edwards made a regular part of his life. Uh, early on in his life, he decided that, uh, you know, what, how he would respond when he saw somebody breaking God's law, when he saw somebody sinning. Uh, and this is what he wrote in his eighth resolution. He says, resolve to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as, as others, and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. Now, I hope you get what he said there. If I see somebody else sinning, I'm not going to look down on them because they've fallen, but I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to feel shame because I am also vile and wicked. Okay? And that is actually true. If it were not for the grace of God, I mean, what would we be? Uh, we could be the worst of the worst. It's only by God's grace that we are what we are. Now, this is the kind of humility that the Lord wants in us because it's not until we're actually humble that the Lord can use us in His kingdom. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But now let's not forget the other valuable lesson that we saw last week here, and that is it's important that we do what we vowed, what we promised the Lord that we would do. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 5, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Now again, this reminds us that the promises that we have made to God, we need to keep those promises because we know from the example of Ananias and Sapphira that, that he is watching and he will hold us accountable. And thankfully, I, he is a merciful and gracious God. And I, think, I really think that Ananias and Sapphira were not believers. 
And that's the reason why the Lord dealt so harshly with them. But the occasion was they made a promise that they didn't keep. I don't think God's going to strike us down for that. But it may come to that if we don't repent and begin keeping the promises that we've made. Once it's broken, that doesn't mean that it's no longer binding. We still need to do what we promised God we would do. Now, this morning, we see the Lord continuing this, His gracious work in His church to the point where the Jewish leaders again arrested and abused the apostles. But notice, far from discouraging them from continuing their work, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. Now, the first thing we see is the Lord continuing His gracious work within His church. He continued to do many signs and wonders through the apostles among the people. I think not just the church, but also uh, the unbelieving Jews. But he also blessed the church with, with unity. Now, the Lord was showing his people and he was showing the Jews that he was present with his New Testament church, uh, showing them that what they believed and what they were doing was, was right, that it wasn't a, a fool's errand, that it wasn't just some sort of a, a delusion that was brought to them by the apostles. You know, signs and wonders are things that only God can do that strike fear and awe because they're, they're so, you know, uh, different than what we're used to seeing. Something that, that doesn't occur on its own. But this love that they were experiencing is perhaps the greatest sign that God gives of his presence among his people. Now, when we love each other as Jesus loved us, we show the world that we actually belong to him. Remember what Jesus says in John 13, 35 to his disciples, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now again, we need to share the gospel along with that example because otherwise they might think we're a group of vegetarians or they might think, you know, who knows what. We're just some sort of a, of a clique or a cult or whatever it may be. But if we name the name of Jesus and don't have love, that's obviously going to turn people away. We need to have both. But love is that main sign, a supernatural love that goes beyond what people do in this world. And that's what we see the early church doing. Now, that... Those signs and wonders and that love, that evidence, we need to realize is a two-edged sword that basically cuts in both directions, just like the gospel does. It not only assured the people that God was with them, but it also struck fear in the heart of the unbelievers. Luke tells us that uh, the rest of the Jews distanced themselves from the church they saw from what was going on, not just in the signs and wonders and the love, but also through the case of Ananias and Sapphira, that God was holy and that he was with the believers. And they realized that they were not holy, and so they would not be safe to be around him and around them. Now, what they felt is probably something like the high priest, you know, the high priest of Israel who once a year would go into the Holy of Holies and, you know, they tied a rope around his ankle and they had bells around his, his robe so that if they heard the bell stop, um, then they'd start to tug on the rope because he, he might very well be dead. If he hadn't prepared properly to go into the Holy of Holies, he would be struck down on the spot. And that would, of course, make the high priest rather um, uh, concerned as he thought about entering into that Holy of Holies. Well, the people probably felt like that or they felt like Peter. When he saw the Lord's divine power in that great catch of fish, and he cries out to the Lord Jesus, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Well, they were afraid that what happened to Ananias and Sapphira might very well happen to them. And so they were content to just respect and admire the disciples from a distance. Now, think about that example. Think about how they responded to the Christians and the things that the Lord was doing and compare that to how things are going today. It's funny how things change. I mean, if the world thinks about God at all today, they don't think of Him as holy. They think of Him as this loving and benevolent Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than their happiness. And that's what He's devoted Himself to is their happiness. 
Today, they're completely ignorant of His holiness and the fact that He is a just God who will hold them accountable for all their sins. And why do you think that's the case? Well, it's because the church has lost its message. It no longer proclaims a holy God. They need to be afraid, though. Unbelievers need to fear because God is, in fact, holy. I think we'll probably come across that at some point in this uh, series on apologetics. They need to hear the truth, the truth about God, the truth about themselves. They need to know that He is holy. They need to know that they are in danger. And they also need the Spirit's work to help them see. Now, all of these ingredients put together is essentially what awakening is. You know, we talk about the great awakening. That's, that's when the Spirit of God takes the truth and all the reasons. And by the way, I should mention that Jonathan Edwards was somebody who regularly put reasons for people to believe in his sermons from week to week because he knew that even though the entire society in which he lived uh, all was in church because basically it was the law. You had to be in church, and if you were outside of church, you would be penalized and even deported from the colonies if you weren't attending church on Sunday because they believed that that is what God required. So everybody's in church, but not everybody is a believer. And so Edwards would appeal to them using reasons why they should believe, and he would seek to awaken them through reason and by the Spirit's work. But that's when people become aware of the truth of these things, of the danger that they're in, and that's when they begin to fear. Now, I bring that up because that's what was happening to these Jews that were standing at a distance that didn't dare associate with them. They were afraid. And if they hadn't been afraid, then what we read about next would never have taken place. Luke writes in verse 14, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Unless somebody is actually, you know, uh, awakened to their danger and their need of Jesus, they'll, they'll never actually come to Jesus. They'll never actually trust in Him. They, they need not only to hear the truth, they need to be convinced of the truth. So if we want people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to tell them why they need to come, that they are sinners. Remember the the law comes before the gospel. John the Baptist comes before Jesus. He's waking the people up through the preaching of the law. They need to know that they are sinners. They need to know that God is holy, who's going to hold them accountable. But like John the Baptist, we also need to point to the one who is able to save them from that judgment. And that is, of course, the Lord Jesus. And at the same time, we need to give reasons why they should believe that these things are true beyond just our saying it or beyond the Bible saying it, because they don't respect the Bible. They don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They need to have reasons. And that, of course, is what we're looking at in the evening and why I think it would be to your benefit if you're going to fulfill that commandment to offer reasons for the hope within you to come and learn what those reasons are or learn additional reasons that you can point to others. All right, well, Luke tells us, as more and more people came into the church, the Lord continued to ramp it up, as it were, and gave more and more signs, even greater signs than he gave through his son, the Lord Jesus. Jesus said that that would be true, that they would do greater things than he did. People would place their sick in the streets on cots and pallets so that Peter's shadow might simply fall on them. Those from the cities around Jerusalem also brought their sick and their demon-possessed, and they were all healed. It was a time of great blessing, a time of tremendous revival. God's kingdom was advancing through Jerusalem. Remember, he goes, uh, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, he says, starting in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth, we're still in Jerusalem, and God's kingdom is advancing throughout Jerusalem. But, of course, whenever God's kingdom pushes forward in the way that it was here, the enemy's kingdom is always going to push back. Edwards tells us that during the Great Awakening, you know, during the, he actually experienced two of these revivals in his own lifetime, what's called the First and Second Great Awakenings. There was also a counterattack from the enemy who was trying to discredit the revival and was trying to hold it back. Well, that's exactly what we see taking place here. And it made me think about the Lord's Prayer 
and how in the Lord's Prayer, whether we realize it or not, that's actually what the Lord is telling us to pray for, both of these things, to pray for revival. You know, Jesus is telling us we need to pray for revival. That's what the first few petitions are about. When we pray that God would be treated as he should be treated, and that is holy, that his kingdom would advance through the world, that his laws would be obeyed, um, you know, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that it would be full, really obeyed throughout the earth. We're praying that God would bring revival, okay? But Jesus goes down later in that prayer to tell us that we should also be praying against the counterattack of our enemy. What does he mean when he says, deliver us from the evil one? Well, he means deliver us, of course, from the devil. And the devil is going to be coming against us to try to stop us. And so we need to pray that the Lord would stop him from trying to stop us. Whenever we step out to do the Lord's work in obedience, we should expect the enemy is going to come against us uh, as, as well. And that's what we see happen next as the Jewish leaders move to arrest the apostles. So as they saw the signs and wonders, they saw the many people being healed, even these tremendous miracles beyond what Jesus actually had done and the people being added to the church and the love and the unity and the respect that they held among all the Jews in the community, well, they responded in a way that we would expect unbelievers to respond. You know, those that don't really care about the honor of God but their own honor, they didn't rejoice in that God's kingdom was advancing, but instead they became jealous. They wanted the people's respect, and they were losing it. So they arrested the, the apostles, they put them in jail, planning to bring them before the council on the next day, but we see the Lord had other plans. He sent an angel during the, the night to release them, and he told them to go to the temple to teach the people there the whole message of this life. The whole message of this life. What is the whole message of this life? The gospel. It's the only thing that really matters. Who Jesus is, what he's done, why we need Jesus, how we can love and serve him in this life. That is the whole message of this life. And so being freed, they went at daybreak and began to teach. Now again, notice their courage. They were so filled with the Spirit and his influence that they didn't even hesitate to put themselves again on public display doing the very thing that they were arrested for. Now, we should notice one thing here I think that would be helpful, and you've probably heard this before. This courage they had and this fullness of the Holy Spirit did not mean that they weren't afraid. You know, courage is really the ability to overcome fear. If you have no fear, then there's something wrong with you. It's not that you're necessarily courageous. Courage is the ability to overcome fear. And it's the Spirit who gives this courage that is strong enough to overcome this fear and reluctance to put your, yourself on the line for doing what the Lord calls you to do. I mean, how often do we struggle with this very thing, with even taking the first step in reaching out to others? The Spirit of God can give us the courage to do this in the same way He gave to them. But notice that while this was going on in the temple, their enemies were completely unaware uh, that these things were happening. When the council convened, they sent for the prisoners. But when the officers went to their cell, they found they were gone, even though the doors were still locked and the guards still standing at the door. The Lord freed them without anybody even noticing. And we know that he's able to do that. You know, the one who gives us these gifts that we have to be able to see and to hear and to touch and to taste and to smell that same person can suspend those gifts when he wants to for his holy purposes. Kind of like putting the guards on some sort of feedback loop, you know, where they keep seeing the same thing going over and over, and they don't see the people moving around them and coming in and out of the jail, okay? So the Lord freed them supernaturally, and that's important. He's able to protect his people. Now, while the council, <clears throat> excuse me, was wondering what had happened to them, somebody came and reported that the men were teaching in the temple. So that the captain and the officers went and brought them back, but gently, uh, because they were afraid the people might stone them. 
because, again, the people admired them and respected them. Now, I want you to notice from this that the Lord can stop people from injuring us, like what he did here with the, the apostles. And, you know, he sets up differing situations to, to protect. Now, the Lord really does this for us as well. Uh, he does this in, in different ways. Uh, one of the ways is, is through law. You know, his law, which threatens punishment. The law that he's actually set up in our society that, that protects life and liberty. It's not exactly what it should be. It doesn't protect everyone that it should. It doesn't protect unborn children. It should. Okay, but it's there to protect, you know, the rest of us anyway. The law that he has put within each person in our consciences to tell us the difference between right and wrong. But sometimes the Lord protects us by convincing the society in which we're living that the things that we hold to are true to the point where those who would come against us are afraid to do something about it. You know, that, that's actually what the case was in Edward's day. Even though most of the people that were in his church were unconverted, they didn't really attack him because they knew that Christianity was the status quo. That's what people believed. And maybe they even thought they believed it, but they weren't actually the Lord's. The Lord protects. That's the way it was in England, at least at certain times. You know, Christians were protected by the law, and that's the way it was also in this nation for a while. Now, we need to pray that the Lord would bring this kind of conviction again by sending His Holy Spirit to convince and to convert that the Lord would bring revival. Because as we see now, as power has changed in our society, we're beginning to see those hints of persecution again against the church. That which was coming uh, like a big tidal wave before the previous election and, and Trump and the, the change of, of power which protected the church, it, it, it did for quite some time. And those that had the litigation against them because they weren't willing to do you know, to perhaps um, honor uh, an occasion of a marriage between homosexuals and they were getting sued and going to lose their business and so forth on account of that. They couldn't even practice their, their uh, you know, freedom of religion. They couldn't do what their conscience dictated. They had to do what society dictated. We were protected from that for a while. But that protection is largely gone. We need to pray that the Lord would send His Spirit, that He would send revival. Well, again, the Lord protected the disciples, but now they were again before the council, and the high priest questioned them. Verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, not only had the disciples disobeyed their direct order because they continued to evangelize, but they also continued to indict the leaders for murdering Jesus. And because, of course, many were listening and believing them, their situation, that is the leaders, was becoming more and more precarious. They didn't want to lose their power. And so they began threatening the apostles. But again, Peter and the apostles did not hesitate before a group of men who had the power to put them to death. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. We're not going to obey you. We're going to obey God who told us that we need to preach this gospel. Now, not only did they confirm their allegiance to Jesus, they used the opportunity again to preach the gospel to these people who hated him. They proclaimed the resurrection after they had crucified Jesus. And Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of God as a prince and a savior to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. And by the way, when he says that, we realize that he didn't intend that all Israel would be saved because as Paul will tell us later, that though the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it's only the remnant that will be saved. There are those who are true Israelites, those whom the Lord has chosen. Now Peter says, we are witnesses to these things. And again, he wasn't asking them simply to believe something for no reason. He and the apostles constituted the kind of evidence that was necessary in a court of law to determine the truth of anything. 
from the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact will be confirmed. And they had, if all the apostles were present, they had at least 12. Remember, Matthias at least would be with them. And uh, 12 voices saying, we have seen him. But then they go on to say there was one more witness besides those 12. And that witness was the Holy Spirit. But he only testifies to those who obey. He says in verse 32, whom God has given to those who obey. And by the way, let's not read this in this sense. If you obey him, he will give you his Holy Spirit. That's not what he's saying. But he has given the Spirit to those who are obedient. And the evidence that he has given the Spirit is their obedience. And this is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. So that's Again, not just, again, just saying, believe it because I say it, but believe it because you have the requisite number and even far beyond of the witnesses here. And, of course, the Spirit of God, if he is willing to reveal that to you. Now, this was all the leaders could take. Their words had cut them to the quick. And all they could think about now was putting them to death. But before they could carry out this plan, God moved on the heart of Gamaliel who, as you know, was a respected teacher and member of the council to intervene. Uh, again, the Lord's moving to protect. He protects them at every turn. And that's a reminder to us that, you know, uh, divinely speaking, I should say, biblically speaking, that we are invincible, we are immortal until it's the Lord's time for us to leave, until it's our time to go home. We don't have to be afraid. Now, this isn't an excuse to, of course, step in front of a car or a moving train uh, to see if the Lord's going to stop that train, to see if these things are real. But what it means is if you do the Lord's work and in what he calls you to do, you have to put yourself in harm's way. You need to realize that nothing's going to happen to you outside of God's will. And the only way that's going to make any difference in your life is if you believe that and trust that the Lord will act on your behalf. Now, first of all, Gamaliel ordered the apostles to be removed, and then he presented an argument to the council. If what these men are doing is not from God, as was the case with Thutis, who believed that God had called him to do some great work for the Jews, but he was killed and his followers were scattered, or with Judas of Galilee, who led a revolt against Rome during the time of the census, and we're not sure which census this was. It could have been the one around the time of Christ's birth, who was also killed and his men were scattered. You know, if this is not of God, then like these other men, these efforts are eventually going to come to nothing. Okay, that was part one of his argument. Now, I'd like to take sort of uh, exception to that part of the argument because I don't think that that's necessarily right. I think we have to modify that a bit. I think we all admit there have been movements that are entirely of the enemy and not of God that have endured to the present day. And if they had been stopped back in that day, we wouldn't have the problems, at least from these particular quarters that we have today. And I'm talking about, of course, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and Islam and Hinduism. These were movements that were not of God, but they continue to the day. So that part of the argument isn't necessarily right if we understand it that way. But let me just mention that uh, it could be on target, if we understand it in this sense, if God allows it, you know, if he doesn't allow it, it's not going to stand. If he allows it, there's nothing we can do about it. And we would have to say that God certainly must have allowed these other religions to exist for the same reason that he allows any evil to exist, because of his holy purposes, and he is working those things out. Now, his second point, though, was directly on target. Verse 39, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. Well, you know what? He was right. This was of God. They were not able to overthrow it and they are going to try later. And it continues to this day and it will continue forever because this is God's only plan to honor his son by saving his people. At any rate, they took his counsel. They didn't put the apostles to death. They flogged them instead, which means they whipped them. I don't know if it was the 39 or how many times. It's not specific. And they ordered them 
again to stop speaking in Jesus' name and then release them. Now, I think it's what the disciples did next that's most impressive and that we should carry away if we don't carry anything else away from, from what we just heard. Rather than getting angry at God that they had been treated in this way, especially since they were doing what God actually called them to do, they were taking a stand for His truth. Instead of getting angry, they were actually happy that God allowed this to happen. They were happy that they were whipped, not because of the whipping in and of itself, but because of the reason for the whipping, for the sake of Christ. Luke writes in verse 41, So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Notice that they were considered worthy, that you know, the humility, their love for Christ, that, that God gave them this task of suffering for him. They considered themselves blessed to take the abuse that was meant for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read in verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They didn't let any fear of any suffering get in their way because they considered it an honor to suffer for Jesus. Now, remember what we read in our meditation in, in Colossians 1.24, where Paul writes this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And, it, and again, Paul did not mean here that Jesus didn't suffer enough to save us. He did. Uh, it was enough to, su to basically save even the worst of sinners, but what he meant was that the devil and the world hates Jesus so much that they haven't finished abusing him. They have not finished persecuting him yet. And since he's out of reach, they will take it out on the church. Now, the worst thing that can happen to any one of us here when we do our Lord's work is that they might decide to take out their hatred of Christ on us. But if they do... Jesus is telling us here we should also rejoice. He suffered what our sins deserved and he died in our place to save us. It is an honor when we can stand in our Lord's place and take the abuse that was meant for him. Now again, the only thing that stands in our way, I think for most of us, if not all of us, is simply a fear of what might happen if, if we share the gospel with others and these people blow up and do something in response to us that maybe we won't like, well, I would say these Jewish leaders did something that the apostles could theoretically not like. They threatened their lives and they whipped them, okay? But their response to that was rejoicing. And so as they thought about that and whether they should obey God rather than man and what man could do to them, they kept right on doing what the Lord called them to do because the worst thing that could happen to them was that they would be put in another situation where they could bring honor to the Lord and they could rejoice in their sufferings on His behalf. If we can just understand that, if we can just adopt that, if we can see that as an honor rather than as something to be avoided, I mean, we wouldn't want to avoid any other honors, would we? But this is one that we want to avoid because it doesn't feel so good. But remember, even though they might be trying to hurt you in some way, the honor that you receive doesn't come from them. It comes from the Lord, and He will honor you for those sacrifices you make as you stand in His place and speak His word and take that abuse. May the Lord give us grace uh, to be able to do that. So let, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us. And particularly, again, as we come to the table, because we do need to deal with the sins of our hearts in this regard as we would come to the table to participate. Let's pray.